people who they get work authorizations with visas and they have longer windows than the visa. So sometimes the visa expires and the work authorization still has three or four months on it. That alone won't give you authorization to stay in the U.S. You have to have a visa with a valid date that's in the future or permanent residency. So if you have a case, and uh, this case is pending, mm -hmm. and uh, they gave you the authorization card, so what's your status? Well, that's a good question, actually. There are some cases, if they're pending, that's technically authorization to stay. So, for example, if you have a pending asylum application, even if you don't have a visa underneath that or some other basis to stay, a pending asylum application gives you legal status to stay in the U.S. until a decision is made. So, yeah, that's fine. Uh, there are certain visas as well, because the backlog for some visa applications is 8 to 12 months. But there is an understanding in immigration law that if you have a pending application, it's not all visas, but most visas, if you have a pending application, that's basically your visa. It's, it's, it's your ticket to stay until a decision's made. Now, I will say this, in the case of asylum cases, if they do make a decision on your case and it's a rejection, a lot of times they'll initiate removal proceedings against you immediately. So they'll, they'll send you a letter that says you're being denied, oh, and by the way, we're gonna have your, your removal hearing in two weeks. Get ready. So it's important that if you are applying for asylum or somebody you know is applying for asylum and they have the interview, that means they're close to a decision. So it's important to make plans in the event that your asylum is rejected to either travel home or find another immigration benefit that you're eligible for because from the moment that decision is made, they give you a window of time. And at the end of that window of time, if you haven't left, you're out of status and that can bar you for immigration benefits down the road. The, the least amount of time you can be in the U.S. without status, the better, because you can overcome certain aspects of that down the road, but if you start staying too long, you start to trigger three and ten year bans in the U.S. So, so what, what, what would happen if, uh, if they decide just to deport someone and his country is just like under just like a crisis, just like in Syria or, you know, those... Well, that's, it, that's just a determination they make. So where they would go? They'll, they'll try to find a place for them to go in their home country, but sometimes they make arrangements with other countries that are willing to accept refugees that are not citizens of their country. So is that through the immigration itself or through the United States? That's through immigration, that's through the Department of Homeland Security, and they make arrangements with the governments of other countries. It's not through the United Nations. It's just, it's an agreement the U.S. has with certain governments to relocate. For example, in Syria's case, the U.S. government has tried to find homes for people in Turkey that they've rejected for asylum applications. But that, that's one example. Iraq sometimes, but mostly Turkey when it comes to Syria. Um, if ICE does arrest you, it's important to remain silent at all times. Again, if it's, it's not in your interest to say anything more than you have to. If you want to say anything more than... I don't consent to what's happening, and I want to speak to a lawyer. The, the same if you get arrested for a crime. Keep your mouth shut and ask for a lawyer. Film or ask someone to film the arrest. It's, it's important to get as much of ICE and their conduct on camera as possible. If they screw up in any aspect, that's just more ammunition for your lawyer to try to get you out of trouble. Don't sign anything they give you. A lot of times they'll try to give you what's called a voluntary deport, departure order. It's basically saying, I understand I violated immigration law. I'm willing to leave, you know, on my own accord. And if you sign it, then that's, you know, that, that's it. You've got to leave. Otherwise, you'll be in violation and we'll try to prosecute you on further grounds. And also, keep and photograph any information they provide to you. Uh, if, even if they so much as hold up something like this, try to snap a photo of it. Because a lot of times, they'll hold up fast food restaurant menus or a letter they got last week and try to claim it's a warrant and just... They're banking on the hope that you don't understand English, you don't understand what's happening, and that you'll just succumb to anything they tell you and give them a reason to arrest you without a warrant. After an encounter with ICE, it's important, like I said, to immediately write down any details you can remember, remember and do it quickly. Even the smallest detail about an interaction with ICE can make or break your case, so it's important to get these details down as soon as possible. Develop a plan with family and friends. You need to have these hard conversations in the event something happens because it can happen in a flash and if no one's around to see it, no one will know where you are. So talk to your family and friends, develop a way to get in touch with each other that 
you, you both understand and that, that can be done easily so that you can find your family member if something like this happens. I always tell my clients to keep a copy of all their immigration documents, scan them into a PDF, and have them saved on the jump drive at a friend's house they trust. It, it, that's just general, generally a good practice for a situation like this that might happen. Just keep them with someone you trust, not on your person. Obviously, keep them stored somewhere. It, it's not that hard, you know, just, just keep everything scanned. You can buy apps on your smartphone that can scan documents for you. It's important to keep a copy of these documents with someone you trust. Mm -hmm. If uh, you get arrested, they do not give you the opportunity to call your friend or family or your attorney after the arrest? Well, sometimes they do, but sometimes they won't let you call for days. You know, they, they're required to process you, but sometimes they take their time doing it. And they do it sometimes on purpose so you get lost. You know, they, they'll take you to a local jail until ICE agents can come get you, but they'll, sometimes they'll do it quicker so they can take you up to the immigration prison and then get you ready for your hearing. But no, they, they don't always give you an immediate phone call. So, it's so they're not required by law to call immediately, to no, give actually, the opportunity to call your family. You're right. It's actually a misconception. You're not legally entitled to a phone call when you're arrested. It's, it's, it's a courtesy that's extended to someone who's trying to plan their defense. The important thing to do is to tell them you need to call your lawyer, because they can't deny you that. So you, need, you, need, you have unfettered right to access the counsel at your own expense, of course, but they will always let you contact your attorney. All of us don't have any attorneys or lawyers to call <laughs> at the whim of the, because it costs money. Every time you call, it is money. So how do, I, how do we handle that? Uh, if I don't have an attorney, uh, what do I do? Like, who do I call? Well, you can call me. Okay. Or uh, I can also give you a list. I, I should have brought it with me, but I have a list of um, the local immigration court for West Virginia is in York, Pennsylvania. And around in York, Pennsylvania, because there's so many hearings that go on there, there are attorneys that will help you out for very low cost or no cost at all. And I, I can give you the list, yeah, actually. Yeah, if you could get that yeah. list, I think yeah. it would be useful yeah. to, to have it and call someone that I'm in this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? Right, exactly. I'll be happy to provide that list to you. But that might be another thing you want to plan for, is, is to find an attorney that you can call and you know will answer and, and help you if you're in a pinch. Also, you'll notice the site at the bottom. If you or a family member are picked up, after about a day, they'll walk in your location. You can go to locator.ice.gov, and that you type in the, your family member or friend's name, and they'll tell you what holding facility they're in, so you can locate them that way. Uh, do they do they just like uh, um, um, get hold of some someone who's just like under sixteen, or they are targeting just like uh, Any really the uh, the uh, people over sixteen? Or, I mean, say do, do they do they do the same behavior with with the children? No, not so much. They they have been despite what they said. They have been prioritizing people that have committed crimes, but. It's, they've also been picking up a fair amount of people that have no criminal history whatsoever, but the majority of them are adults. Uh, they're not so much going after children, mainly because of DACA. You know, there, there's still some uncertainty about who's eligible for deferred action for childhood arrivals. So it, it does, it's not in their interest to start arresting children. For one reason, obviously, it's a bad look. But for another reason, they might be arresting kids who are eligible for an immigration benefit, and that's not the point of ICE arrests. The point of ICE arrests is to find people that have no immigration benefit or aren't eligible for any immigration benefits whatsoever. So they are free from Exactly, yeah. Um, just some quick links about resources. Um, there are a number of benefit programs that are available to immigrants, and if you want to look them up, and again, I'll provide this information, and you can just disperse it if you'd like. You can go to uh, benefits.gov and you can basically go through this analysis and find out if you're eligible for certain immigrant benefits. Uh, the Immigrant Defense Project is an immigrant rights group. They create a lot of flyers and publications that can educate you about your rights and what to do in certain situations. That's a good resource. And of course, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, they have an entire wing dedicated to immigrant rights. They were actually one of the first organizations to sue Trump when he issued the travel ban. So they're very responsive and very willing to help, and I encourage you to seek out their help uh, if you ever need them. 
Anybody have any additional questions? The B5, I believe it is, but there may have been some regulations passed that changed the eligibility requirements. I can check on that for you if you like. The, the thing right now is, in the last year, we've seen so many policy shifts that we haven't seen since the 1990s. So it's kind of hard to keep up with. As a matter of fact, preparing for this presentation, I had to check the news every evening to, to update me on the, the Supreme Court arguments, you know, the, the judge banning the, the, the DACA rescission just last week. So it's, it's an ever-changing situation. Regulations are changing. And, uh, but I'd be happy to check on that for you. You mean EB-5? Yeah, no, that, that is still in effect. And it's my understanding that, that, that nothing, nothing has changed with that. Yeah. It's basically, if you have money, you can get a green card. That's that's what the EB-5 is, yeah, so. Yes? So, so far, my understanding, nothing has changed on applying for a family member other than your immediate family member so far? No, nothing has changed there. But that has been a point of policy with President Trump. He believes that what he calls chain migration right. is a problem. But as of right now, there have been no policy changes in that regard. And as a matter of fact, if you have a family member that's been waiting, it might be in their best interest to maybe get that preparation and get that analysis going quicker than than later because who knows what might come down the pipeline later. But as of right now, there are no changes to that aspect of it now. But if it does, then it would affect the people who are recording the process? No, well, I think he learned his lesson from the, from the travel ban. If you recall, when he passed that, he right. applied it to everyone across the board. And that meant people who already went through the visa application process and were granted legitimate visas. I think now when he saw, the court struck him down in two days on that one, so I doubt he would do that again. Any law he would pass in that regard would probably be anyone who gets this immigration benefit from this point forward, so. But no, I don't think that he would retroactively apply anymore after what happened with the travel ban. Okay. The extent is just restricted for visitor visa or any other kind of it, um, as long as you're eligible for the, the benefit, you can change status whenever you want. It's just a matter of, you know, you have to meet the requirements. There are some visas that you can't change your status on. They're strictly um, temporary visas. They're meant to be temporary. But there are some visas called dual intent visas. Basically, it means if you come to the, the country on one status, it leaves open the possibility, if you're eligible, you can apply for a permanent status. But most temporary non-immigrant visas, you can't change your status unless you've been here long enough to become eligible for a permanent residency or an employer sponsors you or a family member sponsors you. Uh, what about the religious uh, visa? We used to get a lot of amounts from overseas mm -hmm. uh, on religion, our visa. Uh, is there any change in that? Uh, if you are aware of any more restricted uh, environments for the imams? Well, the only restrictions on that one is if the imam is from one of the countries that's on the travel restriction list. So that would be the only thing. They might have to show some additional proof, but it's not a ban. It's just they have to show extra information than someone that's not from that country. So the, the R1 visa is what you're referring to, yeah. I believe. Yeah. That's the one that you got, brother? Yes. It's, there's no, there's no outright ban on that. It's just, R1 the, visa. it's just a higher bar to meet if you're from one of the countries that's on the list of travel restricted countries. Egypt. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Brother Omar, he finished for uh, my visa R1. Oh, he finished? Yes, he. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate no it. Problem. And I pray for you a lot. Thank you. He, him. Okay, great. I, I, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'll pass out some cards. If you all think of some questions later, feel free to email me or call me at any time. I'm, I'm happy to help any way I can. You can also speak to my father and he'll put me in touch with you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here to help any way I can. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. <laughs> Hey, you're